NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government. A significant number of young people in North Carolina are not connected to work or to school. A group of partners in Scotland County is helping youth get back on the right foot. I'm Anita brown Graham. The term opportunity youth refers to young people ages 16 through 24 who are not in school and do not have a job. In North Carolina, 13% of our young people are opportunity youth. Along with emotional consequences, opportunity youth are more likely to engage in unhealthy behaviors, including violence, smoking, and substance abuse. Limited education, no work experience and no support networks often lead to a downward spiral for these young people. Oh, I found our, found our mouse today. An organization in Scotland yep, County is working to give hope and a future to these youth. American NC Party Impact's sure. David Hurst looks at how partners are converting an old prison to a farm where youth train, work, and create a brighter future for themselves. We have enough for more, right? Yeah, it's almost morning. With most things in life, transformation takes time. For Terrence Smith, he's come a long way since the beginning of his journey. Back in the day, I was a fat, frustrated little fella and didn't know how to really handle my anger. Smith's anger often got him in trouble. He went through several youth diversion programs. He says it's considered normal for those raised in the neighborhood that he grew up in. I've had a lot of friends, you know, go um, be incarcerated, being been in prison. Um, I got a homeboy that just came home this year. Uh, got friends that are dead, um, you know, and not necessarily for their own fault, just wrong place, more so wrong place, wrong time. The themes of Smith's story are common for many young people in Scotland County. The area has one of the highest unemployment, poverty, and violent crime rates in the state. A lot of our kids are disadvantaged when they come to school, and it's really heartbreaking sometimes to see the children leave at the end of the year knowing that I can't hug them and love on them anymore, um, knowing that what they might be going home to is not the safest place or not the best environment for them to grow and prosper. Norrin Sanford felt this tension in 2010 when he was at a funeral for a middle school football player. At the funeral, Sanford, who was a mental health therapist at the time, had an idea. He wanted to break this pattern of death and incarceration for young people by turning an old abandoned prison into a place of hope. Sanford started the nonprofit Growing Change, and he invited Smith to take part in his pilot program. It was just a little field trip. I thought we were, um, we were going a lot of different places that summer, and um, I just thought this was like a stop on the map. And I didn't really know that this was the piece de la resistance, or however they say it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we thought Norman was just as nutty as a fruitcake whenever uh, he brought us out here, and he said he was gonna feed me, so I was like, well, I ain't got nothing really better else to do, so came out really just for a meal, and then ended up falling in love in a, in a way. The growing change site sits on a 67-acre property where the Scotland Correctional Center used to be. Sanford began the program by asking 12 young men to come up with ideas for how to flip an old abandoned prison into a community resource. Sanford's goal was to take young people who had been through the juvenile justice system and give them an opportunity to become community leaders. One day, I think we may be even at lunch, and he says, I got this idea of getting this prison and forming this nonprofit organization that works with youth. When he first told me about that, especially with this facility here, I honestly thought he was joking initially. And then when I found out he was serious, I said, Norrin, that was a big undertaking because this place was in very poor shape. Still not in great shape, but it was in really poor shape at that time. And early on, talking with community partners earlier, mm -hmm. they thought you were crazy. They thought it was a, yeah. a crazy idea to flip a prison. Right. What fueled you to keep going despite the skepticism? Well, there was a lot of skepticism. If you're in 
the hardest hit region of North Carolina and you show up to your local leadership and say, hey, we're going to be the folks that are going to flip a prism. You know, they're kind of busy. They're dealing with a lot of issues. Their skepticism is understandable. So first, you have to be able to vet the project. So the same week we received support uh, from Open Society Foundation, the same week I became a Soros Fellow, we were endorsed by Ride on Crime, which is Gingrich, Mies, and Norquist. So we established ourselves on both sides of the aisle. Uh, when we received uh, the Ashoka Fellowship, when we received the Innovate to Empower Fellowship that sent us to the Netherlands to present this model to members of the Dutch Parliament, members of the UN, that helps to communicate that this is an idea coming from rural America, rural solutions, to help address problems throughout rural America. Like I said, they love this stuff. The pilot program lasted from 2011 to 2017 as Sanford and a group of young people transformed the old prison site into a sustainable farm. All across the world. Future plans include transforming guard towers into climbing walls, a prison bus into a traveling museum, and the old isolation chamber into a recording studio. And you seem to give the youth a lot of ownership when it comes to what they're turning these things into. What's the importance behind that? Well, the importance is so we don't get it wrong. And for the youth to have ownership to this, it makes them part of the active solution. So since they're so directly impacted by the system, we need their wisdom to be able to figure out what to do with an old field camp prison. And their work is inspiring the replicable model that we're working on now with North Carolina A&T State University, the Prison Flip Toolkit um, that we will uh, compile and open source and release to the other 300 communities in the U.S. trying to figure out what to do with field old decommissioned prisons. And central to that model, if you want to participate and receive these plans and support with our program, you have to have the directly impacted population central to your leadership. So for us, it's the youth that have been impacted by incarceration. To an, another unit, it might be uh, a prison reentry program. To someone else, it might be substance abuse. But that population, or a homeless population, but that population has to be central to your leadership. I answer to my youth team before I answer to my own board. I mean, the state structure just Sanford says that of the original 12 youth members, 11 of them stayed out of prison by the time they hit 18, a 92 percent success rate. I brought the original group of youth together. You know, I told them, we're going to help you reverse the course of your future. Because when these guys got serious with you, they were worried about being locked up or, or dead by the time they were well into their 20s. So when I told them that we're going to help reverse that future, we're going to help them flip their prison to the man, they thought that was extremely corny. I thought I was a really bright therapist to be able to help uh, that change. They thought it was corny until we walked through 67 acre closed prison and said, no, you guys have been selected. Native American, African American, Latinx, Caucasian, young people that had all been caught up in the system to be able to help us get this right. When they start working together as a team, when they get, uh, initially they were volunteering, now they're literally paid for their work here, um, then they're able to come together, support each other to help support this kind of change. Michael Strickland, known by his friends as Fluffy, joined Growing Change in 2018. At first, the 16-year-old had no desire to go to college. But now, because of growing change, he wants to go to school to study environmental sciences. What is your favorite part about all this? The people I work with, you know, Norrin, um, Logan, everybody else, they're just, we're brothers. You know, we are um, our brother's keeper. So everyone here is my brother. After the pilot program ended in 2017, Sanford opened the program up to not only justice involved youth, but also youth who come from diverse backgrounds. That's the case for Ravan Patel, whose dad is from Kenya and mom is from India. Even though, uh, you know, I was born here as a citizen, uh, my parents weren't, you know, they came here, came legal, all the process, and uh, it's just, it's just, I'm glad I come from many different backgrounds. 
and that even though I'm not an immigrant, they are, and so they can share their stories. Those stories get to me, and I can bring them to the group here. There have been plenty of times where we've been uh, chasing our sheep, and uh, I've always liked to think that I was a hard worker, but uh, just coming here, one of the things I learned is just uh, that you, can, you should never take what you have for granted, because you can, uh, many different people have many different stories to provide, and it just like changes your outlook on how you look at life and stuff like that. This is their old galley. Growing Change is funded through a handful of grants and fellowships along with community donations. They work hand in hand with the Scotland County Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. The council is made up of community stakeholders who come up with strategies to reduce the youth crime rate. Well, if you uh, take a child from a negative environment and, and infuse them with positives, make them feel good about themselves, make them see that they can have um, yes moments in their life, that they can, uh, because of the choices that they make, that they can have opportunities that will make their life better. And that's what these programs do. That's what Norn's program does. Gives these children an opportunity to see that they can focus on being positive, that within themselves that they can make choices to make this happen. And because they have made the right choice, it makes all the difference in the world for them and for their families and for the community. So I will probably keep this one. Devon Goodwin serves as a volunteer for Growing Change. The U.S. Army veteran suffers from PTSD and lives with severe narcolepsy after he was injured in Afghanistan in an IED explosion. Uh, at the time, coming back after IED blast in 2010, I needed somebody to kind of have my back, but also kind of hold me accountable to a higher standard than I was holding myself to at the time. And so that's what the youth kind of did for me. I mean, they made sure that I was always on point and that, you know, uh, even though you have bad days, you know, there's still a lot of good days ahead. And so even at their young age, they still instill more to me than I think any therapist have ever instilled in me. The impact on food. I, he now owns a 42-acre sustainable farm in Scotland County and passes down his agricultural expertise to the youth in the program. It's been miraculous. I mean, some, when some of the guys come here, you're thinking, like, man, how is this going to work? Like, a lot of guys, <laughs> some of them don't want to really be involved, but it's like the prison that... I think it holds everybody to a higher standard in a sense. Um, just because when you start working together, you start sharing stories. And I think that's the one thing that's pretty cool about the site that, that it really lends a, a huge benefit to storytelling. You know, because we all have what I consider a war story. And uh, I think through agriculture and, and working in the dirt, I think those stories tend to come out in a way that they wouldn't come out any other way. Knives all over there. Yeah. Since 2011, the Growing Change youth have grown local sustainable produced food and deliver the fresh produce to needy families in the area. Well, North Carolina, and especially Scotland County, has always been very rich in agriculture. It's a huge area. About 60 to 70 percent of our land in Scotland County is tied up in some type of agriculture. But it's become very much a industry where you almost have to be born into it to succeed. And because of that, you see this small, almost like a closed knit little area, little community that they're into agriculture, but really nobody else gets into it. To see Norrin take youth who probably, yeah, them, they, are, they drive around agriculture and see it, but have never actually worked in it hand in hand and put any sweat equity into agriculture. To see him introduce youth to this, especially youth who have had problems and have had issues at home that are really making their life difficult. To see him take that type of a youth and that type of a, a negative impact and do something positive through agricultural pro programs is really rewarding for me. To the temperature of 130 degrees. The youth leadership team even came up with the idea to use old prison cells to create compost for the farm. So many of our kids are put in positions where they almost have lost the game before it begins. And a lot of these kids grow up and thinking, well, that's the way my mom and dad grow up, so my grandparents grow up, so there's really no hope for me. And I think a lot of them are, are simply born into the, the aspect of well, this is just the way it is and I can't change it. And you see someone like Norrin and this organization with Growing Change saying, you, you can change this. You can make, you know, the bad aspects of your life, put them in the rear of your mirror and go forward and turn something positive into your life. Yeah. Those in the program say the ownership, the care, and the sense of belonging on the Growing Change site not only leads to a transformed prison, but also to transformed lives. No matter what, a child shows to the world, no matter how dark their shell is, there's always a little bit of spark 
of light in there somewhere. You may have to dig through a hard shell to find it, but it's in there. And you just have to dig until you find it. And once you find that spark, then your job is to grow that spark so that the spark becomes the child and not the dark shell. For Terrence Smith, his growing change journey has inspired him to go back to trade school. It's given the 23-year-old hope that he has the ability to become a solution instead of a statistic in his community. I can handle myself in pretty much any situation now. You know, just um, more mature. You know, I can um, thought process and things different, you know. We still have um, some reaching out to do in the community and, you know, like, as far as how to bring in this whole community full aspect and also have some more attractions out here on the site. But I feel like community is very, very lucky because this is a site that can be used for numerous different occasions. Well, I'm joined now with Patricia Caruso, COO with Haven House. In your past 12 and a half years working here, what have you found has been kind of the most effective way in terms of tackling this? You know, it really, I, I would say it starts off with how you engage with kids. There are many effective models out there work, you know, for working with youth depending on you know, the issues that they're presenting with. But regardless of what you're doing or, or what the issues are that kids are dealing with, it starts with how you engage with them. You know, you have to be able to um, be a really good listener, um, ask the right questions, include kids in the conversation, um, having them be involved in the decisions that are made for them. Um, where I see kids not do well are in programs where they're being talked down to or they're being told what to do and, and they have very little voice um, in their own care. Uh, you know, kids have, you ask, if you ask kids questions, they have ideas about what they need. And we need to remember as adults that we may think we know what they need, but, but you know, sometimes we'd be surprised. Um, kids, kids know what they need, and so we can't forget the importance of asking. What have you found uh, to be some of the biggest challenges, difficulties when, when dealing with this issue? You know, I think um, I think we miss things a lot in, in the early years with kids. Um, there are usually signs early on that kids are starting to have struggles, and and I think when you miss those early indicators um, and you let things slide, you know, as as the years go by, those issues start becoming bigger and hard and harder to deal with, and then we end up with kids with mental health issues, for example, that have long gone unaddressed. And how does this work? Uh, impact you? What, what goes through your mind when you kind of deal with or see a success story? Well, the success stories are great because they're the, they're the, the things that motivate me and I think, uh, you know, our staff to continue doing the work that we're doing. Um, you know, it, it sends a reminder to us that regardless of where youth are when they come to us and sometimes the situations are really dire. I mean, we part of what we do here at the agency is work with youth who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so when, when we are dealing with really complicated um, circumstances and then we're able to see that these youth do well and they're able to get into their own living spaces and they start learning the skills that they never learned before that are going to support that independent living, that is, that's hopeful. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think that they're, that it's never too late or, you know, there's, there's not a situation that can't be improved. There's always hope. Growing Change is partnering with North Carolina A&T University to create the Prison Flip Toolkit. Learn more about how your community can get involved by visiting unctv.org slash ncimpact. Coming up on NC Impact. But it have been a struggle on me down through the years, you know, living like that, but I did the best I could with what I had. Many in low-income areas pay high electricity bills monthly, but they cannot afford cost-saving energy investments for weatherizing their homes. In the Chonoke area of Northeast North Carolina, a group of changemakers is making weatherization affordable for homeowners.
NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government.